Question number two, Paul Goldsmith. Mr. Swing, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Uh, what, progress, what progress is the government making to ensure future generations of New Zealanders are not saddled with excessive debt? Oh. Oh. Honourable Stephen Joyce. On behalf of the Minister of Finance, the government is making significant progress in getting debt under control. It's important to remember the situation inherited by the national-led government in 2008. Back then, the Treasury was forecasting never-ending fiscal deficits, government debt rising roughly forever, and at the time, the current account deficit was above 8.8% of GDP. At that situation was clearly unsustainable. The government has taken decisive action over five budgets to get its own books back to surplus by 2014-15 to start repaying debt and to help bring the current account deficit down from those previously high levels. Supplementary. Supplementary question, Paul Goldsmith. Uh, to the Minister, as part of its wider programme, what progress is the government making in getting its own books in order? Mr Speaker. Honourable Stephen Joyce. On behalf of the Minister of Finance, budget forecasts show net core crown debt peaking at 28.7% of GDP in 2014-15 before declining. Longer term projections show net debt dropping to 17.6% of GDP by 2020-2021. Projections of 2009 indicated that if the government had maintained the spending track it had inherited, net debt would likely exceed 60% of GDP by the early 2020s. Government decisions since then mean net government debt will be around 40% of GDP lower than projected. That's a difference of more than $80 billion in today's terms. Point of order. Or I have a point of order from David Clark. Point of Point of order, um, Mr Speaker, I'm concerned about the um, member opposite who continues to undermine your ruling by displaying the card with his IQ on it across the I House there. I was unaware that the member was continuing to use that, but if he is, then if, if it is raised again, Honourable Tohanare, you will leave the chamber. Point of order, Honourable Tohanare. Order. This is a point of order. I seek leave to table no. the number third. Order. The member will please leave the chamber for the balance of question time. <laughs> have we got a supplementary question? Uh, can I ask the minister? Order. I'm sorry, I have a supplementary. Uh, a point of order from Jerry Brown. Uh, Mr. Mr Speaker, I, I fully accept the ruling that you've uh, just made but uh, would ask that uh, when all sorts of uh, signage and other such is displayed on a future occasion uh, by the opposition, that a similar approach will be taken, because it's Order. equally offensive at various times. No, there's no need for any further comment. Mr Henneray was asked to not show that any further, and he continued to do so. That is defying the Speaker. Further supplementaries to question two? Supplementary question, yeah. Paul Goldsmith. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. To the Minister, what reports has he received? Point of order. Speaker, before that last point of order, you had indicated that it was going to be my question. No, I determine when I take supplementaries and for where I take. I did, at one stage, think the member was raising a point of order. The member tends to stand to his feet, not announce to me whether it's a supplementary question he's seeking or whether it's a point of order. Oh, that's bold doesn't dash. make it helpful. Point of order. Point of order. Point of order. Point of order, Mr. Speaker. I'm happy. I'm happy to look at the parliamentary record, but with respect, that's balderdash. I get to my feet, I ask the supplementary question, or I make a point of order. And that sort of criticism won't do. And I have accepted a supplementary question from Paul Goldsmith. I will come to the member in due time. Supplementary question, Paul Goldsmith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, to the Minister, what reports has he received on New Zealand's wider national debt position? particularly with respect to the current account and the net international investment position. Honourable Stephen Joyce. Uh, Mr Speaker, on behalf of the Minister of Finance, Stats New Zealand last week reported March quarter data of both the current account and New Zealand's net international investment position. This showed the current account deficit narrowed slightly to 4.8% of GDP as at 31 March, down from 5% as at 31 December. New Zealand has run current account deficits for around 40 years, but the situation became extremely serious in 2006, 7 and 8, 
when the deficit was consistently higher than 8 per cent of GDP. Uh, the net international debt position also improved a little in the March quarter. It fell to 69.3 per cent of GDP, down from 71.4 in December. While that's still high, it compares favourably with the net international debt position of 85 per cent of GDP in early 2009. Supplementary question, the Right Honourable Winston. How does the uh, Minister reconcile that last answer and the one before that with the current account deficit of 10 billion heading towards 17 billion, every dollar of which is debt, and the worst borrowing record in over 70 years? Honourable Stephen Joyce. Uh, Mr Speaker, I'm half the Minister of Finance. I cannot agree with the member's statements. I think the first issue is that he's looking um, at amounts rather than percentages of GDP. And of course, if you have a larger GDP, then you can actually have a larger amount of debt, uh, which may be relevant to the member in future. Uh, but in terms of the current account, uh, the actual percentage of GDP has actually declined, which is the key point, down from 8.5 or more percent of GDP in 2008 down to around 4.8 now. And uh, that's good progress. Supplementary question, Paul Goldsmith. Supplementary minister, to the Minister. What contributions are manufacturers making in helping New Zealand build economic growth? Honourable Stephen uh, Joyce. Mr Speaker, on behalf of the Minister of Finance, very good question. Uh, manufacturers are making a significant contribution. Uh, since the beginning of 2009, the manufacturing sector has grown by 9.2%. That's a very significant turnaround from 2008, when manufacturing shrank by 12 per cent in just one year. Since 2009, wait and it will come, Mr Parrott, since 2009, non-food manufacturing sales have grown 6.3 per cent. In 2008, they fell 7.2 per cent. Since 2009, non-food manufacturing volumes have grown by 1.3 per cent. In 2008, they fell by nearly 15 per cent and non-food manufacturing export volumes have grown nearly 15 per cent since 2009. And finally, of course, Mr Speaker, the manufacturing PMI is currently at 59.2 compared to 35.8 in 2008. Supplementary question, the Hon. David Parker. Uh, given the Minister didn't know the answer to that question yesterday, can he now confirm that manufacturing exports outside of the primary sector are down in real terms by 17 per cent since 2008 and 6 per cent in the last full year for which there is records? Uh, Mr Speaker, Stephen on behalf Jones. of the Minister of Finance, I have checked and no I can't because the figures I've just quoted, the non-food manufacturing is the closest information. I appreciate the member may have constructed his own series in terms of reducing it. Um, and the other thing is that Mr Parker seems to be trying to use the CPI to deflate the export figures, hence his use of the word, what he calls real terms. But of course that's simply wrong, as domestic CPI is not the way to deflate export prices and volumes. So I'm sorry Mr Parker is just being a wee bit too tricky with these numbers. Supplementary question, the Honourable David Parker. Is it correct that according to the Reserve Bank, the level of borrowing for residential housing is at an all-time high of $181 billion? And if so, how much additional debt does he expect New Zealanders will take on to buy houses over the next year, with house price inflation in Auckland currently running at 15%? Honourable Stephen Joyce. Uh, Mr Speaker, well, exactly. I think, the, again, on behalf of the Minister of Finance, I think the record is significantly better than under the Labor Party. I think the issue... Point of order, the Honourable David question, Parker. My question was whether the, uh, the I, figure I, that I gave is correct. It wasn't what the uh, order, Minister I was going to I heard the question, and if we could give the Minister an opportunity to answer it, then I'll decide whether it's been addressed. Honourable well, Stephen Joyce. Well, Mr Speaker, I don't have the exact numbers and given. I've just been deconstructing deconstructing the member's previous question. I'm rather leery as to his numbers. Mr Speaker. Point of order. He says he doesn't know the answer to that question, so I'm happy I with that. I heard that. that. Yeah. Thank but you. that is uh, not a legitimate point of order. And uh, we're, we're going to have difficulty... Uh, a point, point of order, order, Mr Speaker. Yes. Uh, Mr David Speaker, Park. if the purpose of question time is for the Minister to address the question, and the Minister says I don't have that information, it's not within his ambit to address another question that was not asked. Order, I would, order and I don't need any assistance. The difficulty I want to see cease is a situation where any member asks a question, then decides they're either 
unhappy with the answer or completely satisfied with the answer and then raises a point of order that stops a minister finishing the answer to the minister's satisfaction. If that continues to happen, the best way forward for me is to then move to the next question because I will assume on that basis the person who's asked the question is completely satisfied with the answer and therefore I see the opportunity for the forfeiture of supplementary. I don't want to do that. There will be the odd occasion when it is legitimate for a member to say the question has gone on order. I'm trying to help the House, particularly after yesterday. Um, but we are going to get into difficulty is whenever a member thinks he's heard enough, he raises a point, or she raises a point of order saying that's sufficient, let's move on. Point of order, Grant Robertson. Mr Speaker, in, in the previous uh, Speaker's term, we got into the, into the rhythm in this House that if a straight question was asked, that a straight answer would come back. And the issue that we have on this House, Mr Speaker, is where we ask a question that is, that is a straightforward question, the Minister says, I don't have that information, and then proceeds to go into either a political attack or some other thing, that is where the difficulty lies for us, Mr Speaker. So we would like to see that ruling continue to be in force, and then we won't have the problems that you're suggesting. And I will, I will hear from the Honourable Stephen Johnson. As I recall the question, uh, Mr Speaker, in this particular instance, uh, it asked about a piece of information, then went on to ask some other things. And so the question then becomes, is the minister entitled to make a response to the broader elements of the question if he doesn't have that particular detail in front of him or her? And I think um, to suggest that that's not possible is perhaps um, making it quite hard for ministers to determine how to actually respond to a question. I, I appreciate... No, I don't need to hear any more. I, I appreciate the comments that have come from both sides of the House. With regards to Grant Robinson, the previous speaker did establish a very good habit of where a clear question is answer, asked, it deserves a concise and clear answer, and if that answer is the Minister doesn't have the facts. I still think on occasions there will be the opportunity, and should be the opportunity, for the Minister to explain why he might not have those facts. So I accept the points that have been raised by all members, particularly Grant Robinson, and I will endeavour to see that we get sharp answers to sharp questions. Point of order, sir. If it's a fresh point yeah, of order, I'll yeah. hear it for certain. S sir, I, I, I thank you for your ruling. The, the, um, the only other point I, I'd order, raise... This is a point of order, and it will be heard in silence. Which, which I'd seek your guidance, because I, I, I think you may have certainly made reference to the exchange with the Minister himself yesterday, and that's fair enough. But, sir, you have ruled, and I think it was quite a new ruling, that if a member... And you ruled a number of occasions over the last uh, subsequent months, that if a member is satisfied, gets a direct answer, yes, no, whatever, and is satisfied with that ruling, and you've, you've stuck up for our rights too, so we can rise and say we are satisfied with that, and move on. You did that with me yesterday, sir, for instance. Yeah, and that, that's, that, that's exactly the point I'm raising, so it's hardly a fresh point of order. I'm saying to the member, particularly in light of my reviewing the Hansard yesterday, that if he takes the opportunity of doing that, it's not strictly a point of order, and the risk will be for any member that does that is for me to immediately move to the next question. Question number three. Oh, supplementary question, Honourable. Then it is it correct that according to the Reserve Bank, the level of borrowing for residential housing has increased by around $10 billion over the past year? And if so, how much additional debt does he expect New Zealanders will take on to buy houses over the next year with house price inflation in Auckland currently running at 15 per cent. Honourable Stephen Joyce. Well, Mr Speaker, again on behalf of the Minister of Finance, I can say that I don't have those specific numbers in front of him in light of the primary question, in front of me in light of the primary question. But the point that I can... Uh, well, it was actually about yes, but not about elements of it. But the point I would make, Mr Speaker, is that in terms of the increase in residential debt, that is coming off a period post-GFC which was significantly lower. But nevertheless, the government is concerned about increasing levels of residential debt, which is why we're very, very focused on making sure that we increase the supply of houses in Auckland to ensure that there are opportunities for people to purchase houses at lower levels of debt than they have been able to do in the past. Point of order, Honourable David Parker. Uh, I seek leave to table the Reserve Bank data series to show that the uh, debt figures and increases are as I have said, sir. It's available to all members, I think, isn't it not? 
point of order, Mr. Speaker. Perhaps if the member could tell us the source of the document. Uh, it's uh, Table C6 from the uh, Reserve Bank of New Zealand, but, but which is but, available, I presume, but on the their question, website. But the question was order. about excessive debt, and the minister says no, he doesn't order. know. Therefore, order. it can't be publicly order. available. Question number three, Dr. Russell Norman. <laughs> Thank you.